Okay, we're starting the renal system. So we're doing renal anatomy. Renal is kidney. So we're doing the kidneys. So let's go over some anatomy here. Abdominal aorta, celiac trunk, superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric. Okay. Here's our inferior vena cava. We have our renal vein and renal artery going to the kidneys. Renal hilum, if you remember the hilar region of an organ is going to be the entrance point. It's going to be the spot where all the blood vessels and nerves and um, and lymphatic system is coming in. So follow we're going to want to follow a drop of we're going to want to follow a drop of urea through the kidney all the way out to the bladder. So we're going to have stuff start off in the kidney. It is going to travel through the ureter into the bladder, out through the urethra. All right, your kidneys, if you notice, the right kidney sits slightly lower than the left kidney. The left kidney is completely protected by the 12th rib. The right kidney sits slightly below the 12th rib. I remember it, if you're gonna kidney punch somebody, you punch them in the right side. That's how I remember, it's kinda goofy, I know, but it is what it is. Okay, looking at our kidneys. Our kidneys are referred, so here, check this out. Left side kidney punch, they're protected. Right side kidney punch, it's going to hurt. They're going to pee blood. That's the way I remember it, so that's good. That's the easy way. Left side, right side. So our kidneys are what are considered retroperitoneal. So our abdominal organs, as we talked about before in chapter 20, in the uh, GI tractor chapter, are inside the peritoneal cavity. Our kidneys are called retroperitoneal. So if you go retro, you go backwards or you go back in time. So these are behind the peritoneum. Our kidneys are going to be wrapped up in a, in a fat capsule. And that fat capsule is going to be there just to protect them in case you get hit or bumped or whatever. They're also going to be wrapped up in a capsule, a fibrous capsule. The purpose of the fibrous capsule is to prevent the spread of infection. There are lots and lots of nociceptors on this. So if you've ever heard of somebody with a bad kidney infection, it is terribly, terribly painful. And the way I like to describe it is, imagine taking your kidney and wrapping it up with a piece of paper and it gets an infection. What happens when we get an infection? One of the things is swelling. So as that swells, what happens to paper is you try to stretch it out. It begins to tear and there's lots of nociceptors in it. What are those? Pain receptors. So very, very pain sensitive. Okay, looking at some anatomy here. We're going to have renal columns. We're going to have renal pyramids. All right. And then we get these things which are going to be called a papilla of a renal pyramid. Okay. Working our way in, we get a major calyx. And we're going to have minor calyces. Here, this is a nice minor calyx here. These are nice minor calyces. They drain into two major calyces. So here, here's a pyramid. Here's a column. This thing at the tip here is the papilla. This is a minor calyx, minor calyx, and we drain into a major calyx. So this guy, this guy, this guy, these are all my renal pyramids. Another name for them are the, uh, another name, um, don't worry about the other name of them for right now, we'll talk about it later. So between the pyramids is the columns. Now, my, my kidney is going to be broken up into a renal cortex and a renal medulla. You see how these guys like make this like nice arch here? Okay. So outside this part out here is the renal cortex. Cerebral cortex, think about your cerebral cortex. Cortex is on the outside. Medulla is the inside of the kidney. Your loops of Henle and stuff, where all the filtration occurs, your nephrons are going to be out in here. Okay. These pyramids are going to be a bunch of collecting ducts grouped together and they all come together at the papilla, which drains into here. So the gist of the way the, the uh, urea or the urine, urine formation occurs is gets formed out here in the cortex, it builds up in the collecting ducts, goes through the papilla, it gets dumped into the 
minor calyx, then a major calyx. So we go from the cortex to the renal pelvis, to the papilla, to the minor calyx, and to a major calyx. Then we go to our renal pelvis, which would be this guy right here, and then you go in the ureter. We're going to want to learn all these blood vessels today too. You're going to want to be able to follow a drop of blood. The gist of what it does is it comes into the kidney, goes out here, goes out to the cortex, and then it comes back. Okay, so this is a renal papilla. All right, papilla literally means nipple. So you're going to have a bunch of ducts, collecting ducts, and they all drain into the papilla. Okay, so our blood supply for our kidney, check it out. We go aorta, renal artery, segmental artery. So our aorta and renal artery are going to be outside. Abdominal aorta, we give off to our renal artery. Next, once our renal artery splits, it's going to split into two to three segmental arteries. That's going to be our first split. After we get to our segmental arteries, we turn into interlobar arteries. The reason why these are called interlobar arteries is another name for the pyramids is a lobule. So interlobar, they're between the lobes. I would also be cool with you calling these columnar arteries because they're in the renal column. So we go renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, then the arcuate artery. It's called the arcuate because it's making an arc. Next step, we call these cortical radiate. They're radiating into the renal cortex. So those are our cortical radiate arteries. These arteries right here are all too small to see. They are in the nephron. This is the functional unit of the kidney. This is where filtration is going to occur. We go from our afferent arterial to our glomerulus, to our efferent arterial, to our paratubular capillaries and vasa recta. Now we're back to this stuff. So these are my so this is my flow of blood. I want you to know this. You need to be able to use this. So after we've gone through the nephron, my functional unit of the kidney, we start to drain that cleaned up blood back to our blood supply. So my cortical radiate veins, all right, then we go to the arcuate veins, and then we go to our interlobar veins. All the interlobar veins go straight into the renal vein. And then being a cava. If you notice, the flow of blood from the arteries to the veins are very, very similar. The only part you're missing when you go into the veins is a segmental vein. There's no segmental vein. So, renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery. It's interlobar because it's between the lobes. Arcuate artery, cortical radiate. We go into the nephron, and then we drain back. We go cortical radiate vein, arcuate vein, interlobar vein, straight back to the renal vein. Okay, so our functional unit, the functional unit is the nephron. So this thing right here that I am circling with the mouse is a nephron. Let's talk about blood flow. This is my afferent arterial. This thing right here is my glomerulus. This is my efferent arterial. Afferent arterial enters the glomerulus, efferent arterial exits the glomerulus. I think of my glomerulus as a strainer. So my glomerulus is going to be what's called fenestrated. There's going to be a bunch of holes in it. So what happens is blood goes into my glomerulus and all of the plasma, not all of it, most of the plasma gets drained out. All right. The plasma gets caught in my Bowman's capsule. Let's say my Bowman's capsule is like a funnel underneath of my strainer. So why do I describe it as a strainer? My red blood cells are too big to pass through the strainer, kind of like pasta with water. I dump my pasta and noodles and water into a strainer. Noodles are too big. They can't pass through. Water passes through. In the case of here, my red blood cells are too big. They can't pass through. But my plasma can pass through. So we dump a whole bunch of plasma into this thing right here, which would be like a funnel. It's Bowman's capsule, or the glomerular capsule. So this is going to catch all of, our, all of our plasma. We'll call that glomerular filtrate. Next thing that happens, my efferent arterial comes off and it turns into these things called peritubular capillaries. Okay, The function of these peritubular capillaries is going to be to suck up that plasma again. 
Why? Because my kidneys are going to process a whole ton of blood each hour. Let me show you a picture. So right here, renal arteries are going to deliver a quarter of the cardiac output each minute. So think about how quickly that your, your kidneys are going to process your blood. So you're going to have your blood processed every four minutes. It's going to be filtered by your kidneys every four minutes. So if we didn't suck all that plasma back up, you dehydrate and die pretty quickly. So blood flow. This is my arcuate vein and artery, and we have our cortical radiates. Let's go back a slide. Renal artery, segmental artery, inner lobar, arcuate, cortical radiate. So we're looking at this right here blown up in that picture. Here's my arcuate. Here's my cortical radiates. Off of the cortical radiate comes my afferent arterial. It has the glomerulus, which is like a strainer. It lets the plasma out, but not the red blood cells. And we have my Bowman's capsule, which collects the plasma and carries it into this whole system here. This system is the nephron. The parts of the nephron, the first part here is our renal corpuscle. That is the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. Next part, we get our proximal convolute tubule. Why is it called proximal convolute tubule? Proximal is closer and it's convoluted, it's all twisted. It leads into our descending loop of Henle. Let me get you a better picture for this. It leads into our descent. So here's my afferent arterial, here's my glomerulus, here's my efferent arterial. This thing around the glomerulus is the glomerular capsule. Together they are the renal corpuscle. Arcuate vein and artery, cortical radiate artery. So this is called my proximal convolute tubule. Then we go to the descending or thin limb of Henle. Go to the ascending or thick limb of Henle. And then you get your distal convolute tubule. So proximal is closer, distal is further away. Then those guys drain into my collecting duct. I'm going to jump back a couple slides. You remember I said that this pyramid, these lines represent collecting ducts. So this is a bunch of collecting ducts gathering together. Okay, so let's look at this picture. So we have our glomerulus and capsule. Together they are the renal corpuscle. Then we have the proximal convoluted tubule. All right, then we have our descending limb of Henle and ascending limb of Henle. And then we get our distal convoluted tubule. And it comes up and down here. All right. You can have our peritubular capillaries or the vasorecta. Peritubular capillaries are wrapped around the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. The vasorecta is wrapped around the loop of Henle. All right. So kidneys, what are they there for? They're there to make sure the pH of our blood is correct, the amount of water in our blood is correct, and the amount of electrolytes in our blood is correct. So every four minutes, all of the blood in your body is filtered. It goes through there. If you, it's really important to realize that we reabsorb or we suck back in 99.9% .9 of the plasma that gets filtered. If we didn't, you would dehydrate and you would be peeing all the time. So glomerulus, sorry, arcuate artery, cortical radiate artery, afferent arterial, glomerulus, efferent arterial. Glomerulus is a strainer. We strain out all the plasma. It's caught by the glomerular capsule. And then we start bringing that through the proximal convolute tubule then the descending limb of Henle, then the ascending limb of Henle, then the distal convoluted tubule. Different types of cells we're going to find. Glomerular capsule is going to have just a parietal layer. Okay, your glomerular capsule is going to be there to just catch the, just to catch the plasma or the glomerular filtrate from the glomerulus. Okay, there's going to be a visceral layer on there too. It's going to be kind of wrapped around this glomerulus. In our proximal convoluted tubule, we are going to have, we are going to have um, 
cells with microvilli on them, okay? And our distal convoluted tubule, they're not, they're going to be kind of similar. And our thin limb of Henle, we're going to have thin cells. We'll have simple squamous cells. And then in our collecting ducts, we're going to have cuboidal cells again. Okay, so we have this thing called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. It is the most distal portion of the ascending limb of Henle. It looks like it, it's supposed to be the ascending limb of Henle. It looks like in every single picture I've ever seen, like it is the distal convoluted tubule. I want you to be able to follow this and know the pattern of this right here. So you go renal corpuscle, proximal convoluted, descending limb, ascending limb, distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct. All right. But back to here. It it's the most distal portion of the ascending limb of Henle. It lies against the afferent arteriole. So it'd be taking this and putting it against the afferent arteriole. Taking this and putting it against the afferent arteriole. Let's go back one more slide, two more slides. So we have our, we have our ascending limb of Henle and it's supposed to be pushed up right here against my afferent arteriole. The reason why it is there, there's two types of cells. We have granular cells, our arterial granular cells. Those are mechanoreceptors and they're going to check blood pressure. And then we have macula densa cells that act as osmoreceptors or chemoreceptors. They're going to check the amount of sodium chloride. So here's what it looks like. Here's another picture. Here's my proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb, ascending limb, and then here's my afferent arteriole. All right. This is our juxtaglomerular apparatus. So we have mechanoreceptors around the blood vessel to sense how much blood is going into my glomerulus. And then we have chemoreceptors, macula densa cells, around my, around my uh, limb of Henle to see how much sodium chloride is in it. So here's the gist of what happens. I have my afferent arteriole feeding my glomerulus, my efferent arteriole draining my glomerulus. If I stop blood flow to the afferent arteriole, does that make sense that we're going to have less filtration occurring in the glomerulus if we decrease the amount of blood flowing to it? So if I vasoconstricted here, we decrease the filtration, All right, which means we'd have less stuff going through this tube. If I vasodilate it, we'd increase it, the amount of blood flow going to the glomerulus. Next, if I have a lot of blood flowing to the glomerulus, that means I'm going to have more fluid, more filtrate entering my nephron. The more filtrate I have entering my nephron, the more sodium chloride I have in my nephron. So if my sodium chloride level here is too high, I get vasoconstriction to decrease the blood flow to drop that sodium chloride level. Let me re-say that. We have blood flowing in here. The more, the more plasma we filter, the higher my sodium chloride levels go. I have my macula densa cells right here. Right here, they're sensing the sodium chloride levels. They're too high. We don't want to lose all this fluid. We don't want to lose all this salt. So we get vasoconstriction of the afferent arterial. Stop blood flowing into there. Preserve our water. Next thing, our glomerulus is very, very small, and it is a capillary bed. It's just one cell layer thick. So we have granular cells here that are mechanoreceptors that sense blood pressure. If the blood pressure in entering the glomerulus is getting too high, we get vasoconstriction right here of the afferent arteriole to keep the blood pressure inside the glomerulus pretty normal, pretty like within about 20 millimeters of mercury. Why? Because we don't want damage to occur to these cells. And at the same time, we don't want to be losing too much blood. Too much blood, too much fluid, sorry. Okay, so here's our ureter. All right, there's going to be a circular layer of muscle, and there's going to be longitudinal layers of muscle. So circular goes round, longitudinal is coming straight out of the screen. There's going to be a mucosal layer and a submucosal layer. All right, let's go back. Let's talk about let's talk about following a, following the drop of urea. So 
my blood is filtered inside the glomerulus and the plasma comes out. We call that glomerular filtrate. So my urea leaves the blood and enters inside the renal corpuscle. It travels through the proximal convoluted tubule down into the descending limb of Henle. Then we go through the ascending limb of Henle. Then we go through our distal convoluted tubule. Then we go into the collecting duct. So here, my collecting ducts are in here. We pass through my collecting duct through the renal papilla into the minor calyx, into the major calyx, into the renal pelvis, down into the ureter. So now we travel with our ureter down to our bladder. Check this out. Your ureter comes down and it goes underneath of the bladder and it enters the bladder here. Let me get a pointer. So the ureter is going to travel down underneath of the bladder and enter the bladder right here. All right. So both ureters go down underneath, enter the bladder right here. Here's the opening for the urethra. This is your internal urethral sphincter. We call this area the trigone. Reason why it's called the trigone is you're going to have the ureter, ure, uteric orifices and the internal urethral sphincter. So you're going to have the openings for your ureters and the opening for your urethra all together. So that's the trigone. You'll have your internal urethral sphincter, which is here. And you'll have your external urethral sphincter, which is here. Your external urethral sphincter is part of your urogenital diaphragm. When you feel the need to urinate, this internal urethral sphincter relaxes and you get pressure on your external urethral sphincter. If it is, if it's an opportune time for you to go urinate or mictrate, you go pee. If it is not, then you wait. Okay, so you have control over this external urethral sphincter. Therefore, external urethral sphincter is skeletal muscle. Internal urethral sphincter is smooth muscle. Okay, male bladder is going to be similar, but the urethra is going to be longer and it is going to have different parts. Okay, so here's our bladder. We still have the trigone. Okay, with the urethra, there's the internal urethral sphincter. Here's the external urethral sphincter. That's the prostate in between the internal and external urethra. With the male urethra, there will be different parts to it, like I said. First part is called the prostatic urethra. That's the urethra passing through the prostate. The next part is the membranous urethra. That's the part that's passing through the urogenital diaphragm. And then the last part is the spongy urethra that is passing through the corpus spongiosum of the penis. Corpus spongiosum of the penis is going to be the erectile tissue. Okay, micturation. So as urine accumulates, every about 200 mLs of urine you get, your bladder stretches out and it, you get the urge to urinate. So what it does is the bladder just kind of constricts a little bit against that fluid. You feel the urge to urinate. If it's not an opportune time, you can hold it. Another 200 mLs of urine come in, bladder starts to constrict again. If it's an opportune time, you urinate. If not, you wait. Um, once you get up to about 600, 700 mLs of urine in the bladder, you're going to have to go pee pretty much no matter what. Follow this link. This is a nice little uh, link to um, a video on on the whole reflex and what's happening there. Okay, so micturation reflex, all right, bladder wall stretches. When the bl bladder wall stretches, you get afferent impulses to the brain, okay, and you're going to have spinal reflexes. So spinal reflexes increase parasympathetic activity, decrease sympathetic. Rest and digest, fight or flight. If you're scared and you think a bear is going to kill you, do you think you're going to be able to pee? No. So you need parasympathetic activity. The detrusor muscle will contract and the internal urethral sphincter will open. Now the brain hears the same thing, okay, and we're going to have our micturation centers. We'll decrease somatic nerve activity and you'll let the external urethral sphincter open. 
If it is not an opportune time, you increase somatic motor nerve activity and you keep this constricted, all right? So, pon so your pontine matrician center tells you it's okay to urinate. The storage center will decrease our parasympathetic activity, increase sympathetic activity, increase the nerve activity, say, no, you cannot go pee right now, it's not opportune.